Hi, my name is Lenora. I am an RN holistic health coach. I'm here to tell my story of not just the survival that I had from this story, but the fact that I came out stronger. And I hope that you guys get inspired by it. So when I was born, by the time I was two, I ended up having spinal meningitis, bacterial. It was detrimental. It was life-threatening. I was the only one stricken with it. Even at that young age, I felt like I didn't belong. I've always felt that way. I felt different, weird. Because I came from such a big family, I always felt I needed the attention. Um, my brother, my oldest sibling, uh, got honorably discharged from Vietnam. He had some issues mentally. Um, now, looking back, I feel he had schizophrenia, but that wasn't addressed. What I remember from my brother was that there were meds on top of meds on top of meds for his behavior. My siblings and I were deathly afraid of my brother. So from that young age, till nine, I was in fight or flight 24 seven. We have parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. So the sympathetic nervous system is fight or flight where you feel like you're always being chased by a bear. But to be in that state all the time is so detrimental to your mental health, physical health, spiritual health. But from two to nine, I was always in this state of fight or flight because my brother was scary as anything. He was a big guy. You know, I mean, I'm only five feet tall. I was always small or short. And the way he handled things was through yelling or being physical. But he could go from, let's go look at Christmas decorations and drive around to when he heard firework to kicking up far with his adrenaline or yelling at us for nothing. You know, like really scary yelling. He had a red, um, I think it was a Cadillac when my siblings and I would get home from school, we had to walk from the bus stop up the street. And if we saw his red car there, we'd have a little conversation. He'd be like, do we want to deal with him or should we go hide in the closet until we know his mood is good? Me and maybe three of my other siblings were very close in age. We'd go in there and kind of huddle because we were scared. We didn't know what mood my, my brother was in. And it was bad because my parents were afraid of him too. So it wasn't like we were protected by my parents. There was one instance where he loved bazooka gum and my brother would keep it in his glove compartment. I'm, I'm seven and I'm like, oh, I'm going to get you a piece of gum. Open his glove compartment and I like give her, he, he knows, you know, he finds out and he's, yeah. Who took my bazooka gum? And it, it's really scary to be that young and I'm petrified. I'm petrified. I go hide in the closet. He calls out like a couple hours later. I'm still hiding in the closet. It's okay. He knows it's me. Because I'm, I'm the weird one. I'm the one who takes those chances and come out of the closet. And he just picks me up and throws me against the wall. And it's, it's the scariest thing. And these things happen when somebody takes more than one paper towel. Why do you know how much paper towel? Vietnam, really. There was our agent, Orange. It just messed up his head so much. And what I remember is also I was around. He did try to commit suicide two times before he actually succeeded at it. I remember one before he actually did it vividly. It seemed like I was the only one around. Like we have all these siblings and there's bits and parts of my life that I remember. And I remember just yearning for my mom so bad that I wanted to, I was, I was nicknamed the leech because I would hang on anybody. I wanted attention so bad that it couldn't, it w wouldn't matter if it was the plumber who came in. I'd like at five feet, you know, little hang on their neck. I was the leech. And I remember my, my brother before I went to Vietnam was a, um, altar boy. My mom had shown me letters later on in my life where he would write, what kind of God would do this? This war is horrible. It might have been the second attempt because I don't remember the first, but he used a cross to stab himself in his room. And I remember being downstairs, the ambulance Connor, he's going to be okay. And they're taking him out. And I remember blood and there was a lot of blood and they're taking him out on the stretcher. And he did. He ended up being okay from that. But it was really traumatic for me. You know, to be honest, I sort of wish that something happened just because I just 
couldn't deal with being scared all the time because I was scared all the time. You know, from the outside, it's like, oh, they go to church every Sunday. How wonderful. And the priest comes and has dinner at their house. It's like the perfect family. No. So my brother was the only, was the one who drove. My mother was, did not drive. So he was home and I would want to go home all the time from school. And next thing I know, my brother, my other brother comes running upstairs and he's like, mommy, mommy. And I thought something happened to my mother. And I'm like, what, what happened to mommy? And come to find out my brother put a knife into his heart behind my brother. We had a makeshift little gym in the garage. And my brother was like this bench pressing and my brother did it behind him. Again, I remember being with my mom downstairs, the paramedics saying, he's gonna be okay. I knew he wasn't though. I mean, I was only nine, but I remember seeing him on the gurney. There was no way, there was just no way. And he died. The first thing I felt was just relief. I'm, I'm honest, I'm just being honest and authentic. And, and it was sadness. It was that I felt so good. Like, not good, but relief. Now, at this time, we did have a priest who came sporadically, who was a priest at the um, church that we went to. He came to console our family, and he knew. He planned this out. I felt like he planned it out. because He knew I was an easy target. The priest came now once a week. Like, he would come on usually Sundays for dinner to help our family to console us and to be a friend. Just like any other person or man, I would jump on him and hang on his neck. That's where it started. It was, um, you know, it was in my home. There are interviews I do and it's like, where were your parents? And my parents were right there. But again, it was totally different than it is now. You know, you're talking almost 40 years ago. And now I remember this blanket and it's vivid. It's a red blanket and it's draped over. Where it started was he would drape us, cover us. I'd sit on his lap happily, cause hey, he was paying attention to me. And I sit on his lap. I remember his smell to this day, like a cologne smell, the sweat, so vivid to me. And he would start being fondling under the cover. My mom would fall asleep pretty fast. She'd have her ladies journal and she'd be on the edge of the couch and fall asleep. Forget about my dad. My dad fell asleep like that. And the priest did whatever underneath the blanket. He would, you know, I know what that is now, but I didn't know what it was. But I remember the sweat coming from his head from nervousness and I guess excitement and the low and of course confusion and like, what? What's going on? So this went on for almost three years. Almost every week, he'd come for dinner, and it got so far. I don't want people to think my parents are horrible. They would let him give me a bath. I'll give her a bath. Don't worry about it. So in the bathroom, there's a to the toilet. He'd sit there, and he would put his penis in my mouth, and he put me to bed. And I remember this. I'll only put the this is our secret. You don't want God to punish you. All the words that my mom used to say, I was petrified. I was so scared, but I was getting attention. So I'm going to be honest, like I get this attention from this guy. So after that, I existed, didn't tell anybody. When I was 15, I dated, if you can call it dated, because I'm, I'm as young. There was a guy that I really liked from another school. I was a cheerleader. He liked me and he was a little older than me. He was from a different town. He wanted to date me. Come to find out the guy did come and, and drugs. I never did that. He broke up with me because I didn't like put, put I guess. Before that, he brings me back to his house. I didn't want to go there with him. I didn't want to go far like that. And we're up in his room and he was hot. He raised me and he says, I, I broke your cherry or, but honestly, the priest did that. The priest abused me. I was already not clean. I, I never felt pure. After that, I still liked this guy. I went so far as to go go to beauty school, his school, because he went to a different high school. So I transfer for into this other school in one of those little buses. I go to his school thinking maybe maybe there's a chance. I see him in a hallway. I said, Why 
you know, these may, these are not the words verbatim on my part, but I'm like, why date me again? He said, I would date you again if you weren't so fat. Here I am, I'm almost 16. And couple that with not having control over what the priest did to me. My father being very, like, with my mom, wanting her to lose weight for always hearing that, like, you know, my poor mom trying to take care of the house and she'd cry in her room and I'd be like, daddy, you're so mean. But hearing that all the time, like it's, weight was so important. But my brother would have sleepovers and my brother's only 15 months young. We'd be on the living room floor and his friends would just do what they wanted with me too. And I didn't care. I was like, I just felt like a piece of meat, actually. When he told me that, I was like, that's it. I am going to go on a diet, and I'm going to lose this weight, and he's going to really like me. That was the start of my anorexia, bulimia, years. I almost died from bulimia. I almost died from spina meningitis. This was my second bout of almost dying, and nobody knew what I was doing. Nobody. Not. I did it for six years, bulimia, and nobody knew until... I started talking about my story only like six years ago. I was able to do the diet, but I modified it to just having, I started losing weight so fast because I stuck to it and people were like, wow, you look so good. Then I was like, hey, I have control over this. You know, in your mind, you're not thinking that, but I know that's why. It's like, I have control over this food. Nobody's gonna have control over me. The food is not gonna control me. I can do this, but I was scared because my period stopped. At the time, I dated, was dating my husband now, um, boyfriend, and we were intimate. So I was kind of scared that maybe I was pregnant, even though I was really thin. I told my mom that my period stopped. We went to the gynecologist. I took off my clothes, and the doctor said, she's got to eat. That's her problem. She sees a really thin body. That was my diagnosis. My father, being the Italian, he's six feet tall, my mom tells him, he makes me eat. My father grabbed me, you're eating. Sit down, you're eating. But I don't look thin when I had full on bulimia. I look normal. I look normal or even bloated because I did it so much. My face was so bloated and I ate so much. Like my tank had to be full for me to throw up. So I would do it at probably four times a day at least. But the first thing I threw up was popcorn. I remember it. Um, it was horrible. I'm downstairs, exor pretending to exercise, but throwing up in the bathroom downstairs. And that's where it started. And I was 16. And that went on for six years. Nobody knew. Nobody. I would take baths all the time at home. Like, nobody thought anything about it. There was a scale. I'd weigh myself before. I'd weigh myself after. I'd move the scale. See when, how much I... It was like this game. Always the game. It was killing me. It was just killing me. That's all I could think about. I'm dealing with my suppression from the abuse from the priest, where I haven't spoken to anybody. Although now my husband knows, my boyfriend then, because he looks sort of like him. I'd scream in the middle of being intimate with him to this day, really, but at times because, and don't get me wrong, I, I'm so good right now, but I'm being honest, you know, he kind of looks like him. He was the only one who, who knew. During the time I had bulimia, I had a car accident. This is my third bout with death. Because I don't hear well, I always sit like this in the seat. Now this is before seatbelt were in, came into effect, the law. So I'm sitting in the middle trying to hear the two of them. And that's the last thing I remember from the accident. I hit my head on the side frame of the car. I ended up in ICU, the emergency room. And the next thing I remember is that my boyfriend and my parents are standing around me in a hospital bed, JFK hospital. I don't know what's going on. I have no clue. They're asking me to smile and they're asking me to raise my eyebrows and they're asking me to close my eyes really tight. And I'm like, what are they doing? Why are they asking me this? So they take me to an ambulance right away. And the doctor says, I got to operate on her neck. So what happened was I fractured my skull. The bone in my head was crushing the facial nerve. So the reason they're asking me to close my eyes because I can't put it on this side of my face. I'm 19, I don't know this, but I remember waking up and the first thing I thought of in the hospital was, 
how am I going to throw up? Like, where am I? The doctor operates on me right away and he decides to save, to try to save the movement in my face rather than my hearing. She has a really good chance of the nerve regenerating and having her move her face again on the one side, or she'll have a, like a stroke, but the hearing's gonna go. Now I'm totally deaf in my left ear and I don't even know it. I still don't know what the heck's going on until the day I'm gonna leave. I say to my boyfriend, I'm like, I need a mirror. He's like, no, you don't want a mirror. And now I'm 19. I just, he shows me there's a mirror and I'm just like, I just wanna die. As I look and my face is all lopsided. Here I am at 19 and I'm still thinking about, okay, if I'm going to eat, I need to throw up. Now I'm dealing with my face and I'm just like, God, you got to take me. Like I was very suicidal. I didn't want to be here. Ultimately, I survived and I did it. And, but I still wasn't getting pregnant. And I'm like, what the heck? My husband, was he not going to an infertility special. He doesn't even want me to get pregnant. He wants to enjoy our lives, but I'm obsessed with getting pregnant. All upset. First, I start with a gynecologist, but then I had to go to an infertility special because it was not happening. And I believe this 100% that the priest gave me a pelvic inflammatory disease that was in my body for years. We find out I have a pelvic inflammatory disease and it totally ruined one of my tubes in my, your fallopian tubes. So it's shot. Not up, not working at all. Back then, it was like, I just want to die. <laughs> I'm like, I want children. I don't want to go back to bulimia. I go home with that mindset. I end up getting pregnant. I'm high risk because we're very surprised. The doctor's really surprised, the infertility. And I remember reading all the testimonials on the wall, and I'm like, oh, please, God, let, me, let that be me. Of course, I was high risk, so I had a lot of uh, ultrasounds. And I did still walk. But I was going to do everything. Even though I was pretty much addicted to exercise, I ended up having my firstborn. He is 34, and um, he was perfectly great. Um, my life was just, just, just amazing. But it wasn't wonderful because I still didn't deal with my shit. And the only way to get over something is to get through it. And I never dealt with what the priest did. And it was tucked away. And what my brother did, of course, we didn't use anything after him. And I get pregnant six months later with my second. I used to be obsessed with tests because I used to take tests all the pregnancy tests. So I used to buy them, never pregnant, never pregnant. So, and I ended up getting pregnant again with my second, my second son. He is fine. I have a second one. But in the meantime, me and my husband are like, this isn't good. You know, it's like, we're not getting along because there's the fact that I never dealt with my beats and that I feel like every time we're intimate, I'm like screaming. That was really, it was really hard. You know, it was really hard for him. And of course, hard for me. Time goes on. I still am not throwing up because my obsession with never giving my babies a bottle never giving them formula. I was obsessed about that too. So by that time now, my husband's kind of getting used to this and it's like, we'll try for the third. And we end up having a third, third boy. So they're two years, 15 months, two years apart. We had a third boy, so we have three boys. But after this boy, I don't know what happened. I don't know. But after my third son was born, everything came to a head. I just couldn't, was suicidal again. I just couldn't deal. That's when we went to the archdiocese, my husband and I. How long, 20 years after it happened, we go to the archdiocese. By that time, I thought, well, had to take, had taken a leave to take care of his mom. And I tell them my story. I do go to the Union County Prosecutor's Office but it was past the statute of limitations because people asked me, did he get arrested? We, no, he didn't. There was nothing I could do about that. And the archdiocese, what they did was they gave me therapy. And uh, they gave me therapy, which I took. I found the perfect therapist. And that's what I would say to people is therapists go to school for a really long time. And you just got to find the connection that works for you and the person that you connect with. I saw her for 15 years during that time. I got pregnant again with my fourth boy then we were like one more time we'll try for the girl if we don't get a girl then it's done um and he actually had to go for a vasectomy which is so crazy it's just crazy and I knew these kids they 
saved my life. I mean, they literally saved my life more than they will ever know. But I was not a great mom, you know? I have a shirt that says the world's okayest mom because you only know what you know. And especially when I had my girl because I apologized so much to my kids and then they got tired of hearing it because you hear it enough and it's like you don't believe the person. I've written them letters and they for they forgive me 100% now. We have such a good relationship, but they see how much I've worked on this and they admire me. And my oldest son had to, during therapy, it's an ebb and flow. So there were times where I was still rocking on her bathtub upstairs during Christmas that I couldn't handle things because during Christmas and holidays, it triggered me so much because that's when my bulimia was the worst because there was food, Italian. And I literally thought I was going to die in a bathroom. Like, how am I still alive from doing this? And um, my son would have to come up. Mommy, it's okay. It's okay. Come down. You know, this path to surrender the good thing that comes, I stuck with therapy. I stuck with learning to eat healthier as the years went by. And I went from this to that, like different things. I tried different things. I became a nutritional counselor and I was obsessed with Deepak Chopra, who is a spiritual leader. A lot of people know who that is. I now book, you can read books so the cows come home unless you implement, they're not going to do anything. And I was obsessed with spiritual books. Like I knew there was something wrong. I knew that life is good, but I just got to find it. My husband knew this. So at 39, he gives me a retreat with this woman who studied under Deepak Chopra. So 39, I go to this thing and she gives me a mantra, which is a saying or something you repeat while you meditate to bring your attention back to this mantra, this thought. And I still use it to this day, which I've been a meditator for 20 years. The years accumulated and so I get this mantra and back then we had cassette tape. So it's so healing to me that yoga, the union between the mind and the body, I just get it. So I get a certification in this yoga and I'm like, wow, this is great. I'm healing little by little, have my therapy. I go and um, I have a best friend at the time and she's a nurse. And I'm like, I love to read. So we don't have all this social stuff, media. And I would stay at our house for my retrieve and in, on the bookshelf, there'd be nursing book. So that's what I would do at night. I would take down a nursing book and I'd start to read. I'd be like, I love this. This is so interesting. I'm like, I'm going to be a nurse. So I get my, get my license. So I'm a freaking nurse at 47. So I'm very proud of that. That's one of my, besides my children, very proud of that. I'm always researching. I'm always studying. So I've got a nutritional certification I've got. I became a Reiki master. I um, am a registered nurse. I, you know, I'm a yoga teacher and I've been a personal trainer for like over 30 years now. So 12 years later, I write, I've been writing my book. I'm going to name it Path to Surrender, My Journey to Freedom. I also, I wrote this almost 10 years ago. It's called The Cat in the Mat. I'm going to do this. I want to get this published because it's really cute. And it's for kids and it's bringing your nervous system down too because kids need to do that too. That is my story. And, and now I am the happiest and the healthiest I have ever been at 58. And you can do it. You know, you got this. We are all worthy no matter how young you are. And God is not a punishing God. And it wasn't my fault. I learned to keep the lines of communication open no matter how I felt being the world's okayest mom on a shirt I still treated my kids my big thing was you treat me with respect I'm gonna treat you with respect 